completely. So, hi guys, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Dr. Luigi Tizano from Simon Center for Geometry Physics, Stony Brook University, in our QASTM forum. This is the 75th talk in the series. And uh, uh, thanks, Luigi, for accepting the accepting to give this talk for our forum and we are welcoming you and uh, you can start thanks uh thanks a lot for the invitation and thank you uh also for organizing this uh, seminar series and congratulations for running it for such a long time um so today i'm going to tell you about this work i published with my co-authors uh, last August. And uh, in, with uh, my co-authors were Christian Copetti, uh, Alba Grassi, and Zor Komargotsky. And if you feel uh, really interested in this topic, I also suggest, suggest you to uh, go on the website of the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics, and you'll find a series of online seminars that were recorded on this topic uh, in the last fall. And this is the title of the collection of videos. And so here you can get the most updates on this topic and on other uh, neighboring uh, works. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, very slowly and maybe pedagogically by reminding some famous aspects of thermodynamics uh, of black holes in ADS CFT. And this is mostly due to an old work by Witten from 1998. Uh, so in uh, the one one question. Can you uh, yes. speak a little bit loud? Because this is recording, yes. no? OK, OK. Is it better if I speak like this? Uh, can you speak once? Louder? Is it yeah, okay? Louder. Yeah, I'm trying my best. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, so um, as I said, I want to uh, review some famous aspects of the of black hole thermodynamics in ADS CFT. And so, um, as we know, in the holographic principle, uh, we can compare observables between the world of quantum field theory on one side and the world of gravity on the other side. And in particular, if we are interested in computing the partition function of some conformal field theory on a d-dimensional background, we should uh, compare that with the, in somehow the path integral of a gravitational theory on the bulk side of the correspondence. While in, this, in the conformal field theory, we know what we need to do when we compute the partition function, we should compute this kind of observable, which is the trace over the Hilbert space of the exponential of minus beta times the Hamiltonian, where this beta is the radius of a circle because we imagine the CFT in, the radi in a radial quantization scheme. While in the gravity side, things are much more complicated because uh, we should perform this gravitational path integral for which we don't have like an a priori well-defined non-perturbative definition. But uh, what we know we should do is that we should sum over all the configuration, which are solutions of the gravitational equation of motion with a correct boundary condition at infinity. And the boundary condition are such that the boundary of this space times uh, B should be the same as the manifold where we define our conformal field theory in the dual side. So the, the, the basic picture is this, for each manifold that we wanna study in the quantum field theory sense, we should basically fill up an extra dimension and study all the configuration B, so that are labeled by this value alpha whose boundary condition can match this manifold at infinity. And in particular, a very important point is that in a gravitational setting, uh, even though the boundary manifold can be unique, there might be many, many gravitational saddles, so many of these alpha here. 
And in the gravitational sense, we are instructed to sum over all of these uh, saddles. And this is a very important point. So we should sum over all the Bs. Now, today I'll be focusing on theories which are in four dimension. And in particular, I wanna study a specific manifold, M4, which will be the product of a trisphere and of a circle. And for this uh, four manifold, there are two known um, solutions of the gravitational equation of motion. B, so this B so you, alpha. Any particular notion to study four dimension? Sorry, can you repeat any, the any question? Any particular reason to study four dimension? So for, okay. So for what I'm gonna tell today, absolutely, because uh, I'm gonna discuss a specific transition that is, uh, uh it's, that has a dual which was in found in in four dimension but uh, this this is very general it could be studied in any dimension and in fact it's been subject of millions of works okay. in all sorts of dimensions okay okay um but it will be clear soon why we are focusing on four dimensions okay sure and okay so so for this four manifold, there are two known saddles which were found a very long time ago in a very beautiful work by Hawking and Page. And this was a pioneering work from the, seventh, from the 80s uh, about the study of quantum gravity in ADS-5 and predates uh, of a lot of time uh, ADS-CFT. So let me write down for you the metric. We can write down the metric of these saddles in a very simple way. So we take some spherical ansatz like this. And when we need to define a function f of alpha, which takes the following form, when alpha is equal to one, the function f, f of one will have this form here. So it's one plus r squared over l squared, where l is the curvature radius of ADS5. Uh, instead, when alpha is equal to two, we take a slightly different form for this function. So it's the first part is as before, but now we have an extra factor here, which is minus mu squared over r squared. And by I define mu squared as four times the Newton constant times the mass. So, uh, so is there is a general form of f of alpha as a function of alpha or something like that? No, uh, alpha here is just, uh, you know, so for, for a given, okay, so this, this just labels the amount of saddles that you need to sum oh, over okay, okay, for okay. a specific config. Okay. Alpha doesn't enter in, okay. In the solution. Yeah, exactly. But uh, there is, so a slightly different point is that uh, if we were not in, uh, um, in, in four dimension, but in other dimension, there is a way to generalize this function for general dimension. Uh, this is in fact uh, already in the work by Witten. Okay. Okay, so uh, this, so the metric with this function F1 will define what I call B1 here. And this is what people call the Euclidean or thermal ADS5. So this is a space called ADS5 and we see it as an Euclidean. So the the, the time coordinate is identified on this space time with period beta. Now, instead for alpha equal to two, this metric is actually, if you look at it very carefully, it re resembles the metric of a black hole. And in fact, this is a generalization of the famous worksheet black hole to ADS5 space time. So for alpha equal to two, we should think that the main gravitational saddle that we need to consider is a black hole in ADS-5 spacetime. And so if you have a black hole, you can also solve it for the location of its horizon. And how do we do that? We basically set this function F2 equal to zero and we solve for the variable R and then we pick the value of R which gives you the largest solution and we define them that as R plus. So R plus is the largest solution to this equation. Okay. Now that gives you the location of the horizon. And, but what we need to do is that, so in general, this metric will not be smooth or complete unless we properly identify uh, the, the time coordinate with the 
properly identified period beta. And the way to do that is to identify beta with four pi over the derivative of this function evaluated at the, at the location of the horizon. And this gives us a very important formula, which is this function beta. So as you can see, beta is only a function of this of R plus, which is the location of the horizon and of the curvature of radius of ADS. And importantly, uh, we can also identify this beta by taking its, its inverse with the temperature of the black hole. So this was done by Hawking and Page a long time ago. So this beta for you, identify for you the temperature of the black hole. So we just have to take the inverse and we can express this temperature in this convenient form. Okay, so now since this function beta as a maximum as a function of R plus, there is uh, something interesting going on. So basically when beta is small enough, sorry, uh, when beta is small enough, uh, we'll see that, so if beta is small enough, the temperature here will be gr growing to infinity. And this is a phase in which in the gravitational path integral, the black hole will dominate. And this is very important. Conversely, if beta is large enough, so if the temperature is very small, it is not convenient to, to, to use this set dole anymore in the action, but we should switch to the Euclidean ADS5. So as you see, there are two competing set dolls, which are the black hole set dolls and the Euclidean ADS5 set dolls. And their competition is uh, basically given in terms of the value of beta. So let me be slightly more specific about it. Let's see how, let me show you how we can derive this result. So remember that if you have an ADS5 uh, solutions of the equation of motion, like the one we are studying here, their Ricci scalar is minus six over L squared, L squared. So if we plug solution of the equation of motion inside the action I, which is exactly what we should need to do, what we need to do, you know, to sum over these saddles like here. So if we, plug these two values of the saddles inside, we'll find a very simple form of the action. So the action will take this form for any alpha and it will be just basically the integral over the volume of the space time of the ADS space time. But of course the volume of ADS is infinite. So these integrals require some regularization and this can be done. It was shown by Witten how to do that. And so, let me discuss for you what's the value between of the difference between the action evaluated on the black hole saddle versus the value of the action evaluated on the Euclidean ADS space time. So this takes a very simple form, uh, which is this one. And so we can see something immediately here, which is for small values of R plus, uh, this, this function here, the difference, so this function becomes negative and so, sorry, uh, this function is positive. So the difference between the saddle um, B2, the, the, the value of the action on the saddle B2 and the value of the action on the saddle B1 is positive. And so this tells you that for a small R plus, what is dominating in the ensemble is the uh, Euclidean ADS5 background exactly as we saw before. Uh, but if R plus is large enough, then this difference between the two set dolls turns negative. And so the value of IB2 is smaller than IB1. And so it is more convenient for the path integral to be uh, localized around the set doll of the Schwarzschild black hole. And so this was identified uh, in this context, in this gravitational context by Hawking a page as a phase transition, which indeed kicks in at a specific value of the temperature, which now we call unsurprisingly the Hawking page temperature, which is uh, three over two pi L. And what is the significance of this temperature is just the point where the difference between these two set dolls is zero. And this point is exactly at R plus equal to L. And indeed, if we plug 
r plus equal to l inside here, we'll find that this is equal to one over two pi l times two times one plus one, which is three over two pi l. So when the temperature is zero, there is a switch in dominance between the two saddles, and we should switch between Euclidean ADS5 and the black hole saddle. And another important thing that we can do is that from this action, which is properly regu regularized, we can compute the entropy. And so the entropy is simply given by this expression here, which we can repackage in the famous form of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, which is A over 4GN, where by this A, we mean uh, the volume of the surface that lies at R plus. And the volume of the surface at R plus, which is the horizon, is precisely the volume of a three sphere times R plus cube. So now, if we have all this understanding of the gravitational phase, uh, it is interesting to ask, what is the dual picture for such transition? So we saw in gravity that there is a transition between these two saddles. And of course, I told you as well that this should be interpreted as uh, some computation that has to do with the dual quantum field theory. So very long time ago, we found out that uh, such, a, such a phase transition as a clear analog in four dimensional theories and it's interpreted as a deconfinement transition. So a deconfinement transition is a very famous transition that kicks in in large and quantum field theory and can be summarized as the following way. So at large beta, so a small temperature, we just said that in gravity, we expect that Euclidean ADS5 will be the dominating phase. And this phase in gravity is what we think as dual to a confined phase in quantum field theory. So a confined phase is a phase uh, at low energy, for example, of strongly coupled theories. And we expect that this phase is, for example, dominated by a singlet. Imagine, for example, a pure young mills theory at low energy will be dominated by color singlets. And entropy in such phase will be scaling at large n irrespectively of n. So it will be an order one scaling at large n. However, when the temperature is very high, so beta is small, we just told you, I just told you that the dominating saddles is a black hole. And the dual to a black hole in quantum field theory should be a phase uh, where deconfinement is kicked is kicking in. So deconfined phases in, for example, in Yang Mills theory will be a phase dominated by uh, liberated gluons. So there are uh, many, many, uh, a huge number of liberated gluons that form plasmas and control uh, the ensemble. And so their, their entropy will grow very fast with n. In particular, their entropy takes this characteristic form. It scales like n squared at large n. So you can track the difference between the two phases in the dual quantum field theory by studying the entropy in the dual theory. So this is in a snapshot, uh, a story, uh, a review of an older story by Witten. And to, today we are gonna uh, discuss some more recent developments to this story. So let me tell you what, but uh, please, Please ask me any question if you have any at this point. Sorry, Luigi. Hi. Yes. Uh, do you know, it, so it is known the order of the phase transition of between these two phases, if it is first or second order? You mean in gravity or in Q? Sorry. So, so in both in gravity, so in gravity uh, is certainly first order. And uh, in, in, in gauge theory, now it depends a lot on the kind of theory is you are studying and uh, on the type no, of exactly observer. because I was remembering that it was a kind of a crossover, not a real uh, phase transition. So I was wondering yeah. in this case, no, maybe so around a circle, something like this. Sorry, can you repeat? The, the quantum field theory, like n equal four on a circle, not the dual of ideas. Yeah. And this no n equal four n equal four on a circle gives you doesn't doesn't give you crossover. 
gives you maybe something that's slightly so it's a it's technically weekly first order uh -huh. which is uh, similar very close to a second order but not really okay. but this um, is with the gravity side right because on the gravity side it's first order so it's no but uh, so so the okay sorry the the dual to this story here should really be like young meals a large n and uh, if you do that, that will be also first order. But uh, Yam Mills is different from n equal four. Mm -hmm. So you know you should study Yam Mills on S3 times S1, then you study that that weak coupling. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then you study correction in lambda to pure Yam Mills. And that you can do. It was this paper by Aroni et al. And there the transition, you can see that in, in this non susi case, the transition is first order. But uh, in this uh, specific setup uh, that I'm going to talk about today, you'll better what's the difference with, with, with that story and my story today. OK. Um, OK, so any other question? OK, so, uh, so around 2004, there was uh, some important result by uh, Gutowski Real and so so Chong Pope, Liu Cvetic. It, it was a very interesting story where people found uh, ADS5 black holes, which are also supersymmetric, but they preserve the least amount of supersymmetry, which is one over 16 BPS. And these black holes are also characterized by their electric charge which I call Q, and their angular momentum, which I denote by J. And these black holes are very special in a way. They are very different from the one that I just told you about because they are extremal in a sense that their, their temperature is zero. We should, think, we should think about this kind of black holes as basically the ground state of some, of some Hamiltonian in the dual picture. But even though their temperature is zero, this is uh, quite interesting, their entropy is non-trivial and it was computed also around this time. So their entropy takes the following form. And when we, when we study theories at large n in the grand canonical ensemble, we should remember that both Q and J scale like order n squared. So this black hole entropy is hugely degenerate and gives you a growth like order n squared, which is exactly what we expect from a black hole. Now, there, are, there is a, natural, a, a couple of natural questions that we want to try to discuss today, which is, can we capture uh, this entropy, this degeneracy in the boundary quantum field theory? So can we, can we do this computation in quantum field theory? And also, how the, a natural question to ask is how does this Hawking page transition business that I just introduced for you works in this setting? Because what I just told you about was not about a supersymmetric theory. So we should try to understand what happens with this special kind of black holes. OK, so in order to do that, we basically have to go back and try to define this observable here which is the partition function of some conformal field theory on S3 times S1. And in order to do that, uh, I will study this theory with supersymmetry. So I want to I wanna focus on theory which have at least n equal one superconformal symmetry. And OK, I want to study their partition function. But as you see, I'm gonna, I will study that in a very particular way, which is as follow. So let me remind you, what does this partition function mean in an n equal one SCFTs? So in general, if we are able to study this partition function, uh, this should study, this should count uh, supersymmetric states on S3 times time. And because of um, Radial quantization, we should think about this as a sum over all BPS local operator on the theory. Now, if we take this object and we twist it with a particular fugacity, which is minus one to the F, this will be 
an object which is completely independent by the exactly marginal deformation. So it turns out that there is a specific version of this partition function, which is completely independent of the coupling. And so it gives us a non-perturbative and exact handle on this problem. And let me show you how we define this object. So we pick a supercharge Q. So this is one of the supercharges of the n equal one SCFT. And we know, we, we know that one of these Q will have this anti-commutation relation will be, which is given by Delta. This is just the scaling dimension or the energy or the Hamiltonian minus two J1. J1 will be an SU2 isometry that acts on the three sphere. And then we have little r, which is the U1R charge of the theory. Now, we will define BPS states in this theory as uh, states that satisfy this condition here. And so for me, this object, which I call the superconformal index, will be a trace over the Hilbert space, or which means a trace over all the states which satisfy this condition of minus one to the F. This is where F is the fermion number, it is zero for bosons and it is one for fermions times these two objects here. So this P and Q are two uh, fugacities. These are like fugacities, like what we do in statistical mechanics. And they are weighted by this factor here. So Delta is as before, and now J2 is a, it's a parameter for the other SU2. So inside this S3, there will be two SU2 acting let's call left and right. And now we introduce a J2 for S2 to right. And so this is the form of the index. So because it is an index and because I introduced this object, which is why I introduced this object here, this is completely exact non-perturbatively. It doesn't depend on marginal deformation. And that's very important. And so in the context of n equal four super Meals. So if we think about n equal four as a very special example of an n equal one theory, this will be an object that counts 116 BPS local operators. And in general, this operator can be, are very complicated to study in general. So their, their dynamics is very rich and very complicated, but nevertheless, their, their index is protected. And that's very important. But uh, even though we got a, an exact object to play with, which is very interesting. Uh, we had to introduce this minus sign here. And in general, you know, we are gonna sum over many, many states weighted by this sign here. And so this can uh, quickly run us into another problem, which is the following. It could be that we start summing here over this silver space. And there are many cancellations that kicks in and this cancellation can be even more severe when we want to study large n quantum field theories. And so it might be that because of all this cancellation, this index might not grow as we expect. So that might, might, that might run us into a problem. And so let me show you exactly what happens because of this uh, sign here. So there are some uh, results that have been known for a while that uh, that tells us that we can write this index here in a more convenient form, which is by using uh, uh, unitary matrix models. So I'm going to tell you now that this index can be, that, which is the same of this thing here, can be interpreted as a unitary matrix model. So this U's here are unitary random matrices. Uh, here we are taking a product over theta i. Theta i's are the eigenvalues for these matrices u. And we have an exponential here. And the action is given basically by an infinite sum of double trace interactions with these couplings a n here, uh, which are known exactly. So the a n takes this form. This is completely known and understood. And so one could then trade the problem of computing this abstract quantity here 
as basically computing. So in, in particular, to study the large end limit of that quantity, one would just have to study the large end limit of this unitary matrix model. And this was indeed explored already a few years ago by this very nice paper by Sandborg and also by Aroni and his collaborators. And, uh, and then more recently by also Kini, Maldestina, Minwala and Rajju. But uh, we will see right away that for the super conformal index, there is an issue, which is the following. So clearly uh, this unitary, oh, sorry. Clearly this unitary matrix model has a large n phase transition when this a n is equal to one because the a n equal to one point is where the action, the entire coefficient in the action switch from being positive to negative. And so in particular, we can see from the form of this function here that when P and Q are real and for P and Q inside this window, so between zero and one, all these couplings a n minus one, sorry, are negative. And that's very uh, somehow disappointing for the following reason, because if all the couplings are negative, all the coefficients here are negative. And so this section at large n is minimized by the configuration where the trace of u to the n is zero, which is the most symmetric configuration. This will be the most dominant contribution. And in particular, it tells us that the scaling at large n of the index in this context would be order one. So we don't find any order n squared, which is what we would like to be finding. And this is really an issue because as I told you, we found a confined phase, but what we should have found is that the index scales at order n squared because we expect the confinement to be the dual of a black hole in ADS5. So it cannot be really completely correct that at large n the index scales at order one. So we need a way to uh, cure this issue, this pathology here. And I'm going to tell you today what's the way in which we can see that this issue, well, that basically this story here was basically too fast and so th there's a number of things that we need to do to understand that this thing was too fast. But uh, do, did you understand what is the issue that we are trying to solve? Please feel free to ask questions now. Any question? Otherwise you proceed. People will ask questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. so. We found order one scaling and we want to correct this uh, problem. So as I told you, so this index, let's go back for a second to the definition of the index. The index really what it is, it's a past integral for the n equal four theory on this space S3 times S1, twisted by certain chemical potential. But very importantly, people were able to study what, what does the index depends on in this business? And people were able to identify that the index is sensitive to complex structure moduli on this space S3 times S1. So if we see S3 times S1 as a complex manifold, so imagine that we parameterize that in terms of a complex structure, there are two complex structure moduli that can be expressed very simply in the following form. I denote them by P and Q. Now beta here is the radius of this circle here. And then there are these two parameters, sigma one and sigma two, which are in general real. And these parameters sigma one and sigma two control the vibration of S1 of beta over S3. In particular, if we remove sigma one and sigma two, then this, is, this will really be the direct product. While if sigma one and sigma two are more general, we should think about this space as a more general vibration of S1 over S3, okay? So, in part, and, and also what we have to remember is that because we have these two complex variable here, they define 
a moduli space, so a space in which we can vary the, the values of these uh, two va variables, P and Q. So we can imagine like a two dimensional complex plane spanned by these values of P and Q. And this is called the moduli space of complex structure deformation. Okay. The, the, subtle, the subtle issue here is the following, that the superconformal index is not a single valued function of these variables P and Q, but it lives actually on a triple cover of this space MCS. And why do I say that the index is on a, lives on a triple cover? And it's, it's for a very trivial reason, because if we go back to the definition of the index, we see this factor of one over three that appears here. So this factor, which looks innocuous at the level of this definition, it will be, it's very important for the global structure. So in particular, when we define values of P and Q, we should remember that there are basically fundamental domains and that this P and Q have to be identified over these fundamental domains. And so the index will take values in something that looks like a triple cover of this space here. So in order, so, so now, now comes the, the way to, to so in, in order to study the index as a general function on this space and not anymore on the single space here, what we did in our work was to introduce a general parametrization of this kind. So we take P and Q equal to each other, but then we just complexify them in the most general way. And I can tell you right away that as soon as you do that, and I'll show you how that's gonna happen, you can find that the index actually has deconfinement but the interesting thing is that the index have deconfined phases, not on the first uh, sheet, which is this one. So here there is no deconfinement, but in these other sheets, you can find indeed that the index has deconfinement. While, so basically everywhere here in this gray region, if you were to study the, the index for values of the parameters in this gray region, you would only see confinement. But if you go inside these regions here, the index would scale as order n squared, okay? And so technically what this parametrization does is that it interferes with the cancellation. So this parametrization interferes with the cancellations that we, that we have because of the minus sign in the index. And so by studying the index as a general function of this parameter, we can basically uh, obstruct cancellations from the minus one to the F and study the index uh, more carefully and find these deconfined phases. Oh, sorry, Ari, so the, the point is yeah. that uh, what was wrong before is that you assume P and Q to be real. Yeah, and not just that because, yeah, and you assume that, they are, that the index is single valued function over, over this space. Okay. Yeah. This has an interesting implication, which I can also comment later on. It, it doesn't stop to uh, this problem. It has implication for a lot of this uh, type of objects. Okay, maybe, maybe we can discuss about it a bit later. Okay, so I, I wanna stress that uh, this ideology uh, was also kind of put forward maybe in a different language, but it was put forward by, this by these authors. So there's a, uh, it was around 2018, work by Cabo Bizet and his collaborators and by uh, Choi and his collaborators and also by Benigni Milan. And there has been a lot of activity following uh, these three papers on the study of indices for general values of these parameters. But uh, let me tell you why this is a big change and how, how can we see that in the old story? Because I told you 
the, the old story told us that we have to study this kind of matrix model. So let's see what, what is changing now. Okay, so if we, if we have general P and Q complex, what we need to study is a matrix model now, which is exactly as before, but now this coupling are in general complex. So we need to study a unitary matrix model with uh, coupling constants that are all complex. And this is, uh, this type of models have not been studying at all or very little. And so our, uh, one of the main merit of our work was to kind of introduce some formalism to treat these models, which are also of interest in any large N uh, gauge theories. Okay, so let me show you what's the difference here. Let me consider a simple model, which is the one where we only keep n equal to one here. So we truncate this large n unitary matrix model to a model of only one coupling. Okay, so then what we have to do is to study the large n solution of this model. And here, okay, I'm gonna skip one step, but you have to stay tuned with me is that the large n solution for this model with only one coupling is basically given in terms of a sum over a subtle point G of this exponential function here, where Q is given by this expression here. So Q has a quadratic piece in G, and then depending on the real part of G, it has two branches, another quadratic part here, and then this part here, which, has, which is linear and logarithmic. And it, it is important in order to do this manipulation that G is the general complex variable. So here we really are doing a sum over a complex, uh, in general, we are integrating over a complex G plane. So we have to be very careful uh, with the kind of saddles we are picking. Okay, so this is a sum over saddle points, right? And there's a, we have to find the saddle points by taking derivative with respect of G of this function. And there's, a, there's an obvious uh, saddle point at G star equals zero. And when G star is equal to zero, uh, the logarithm of this object Z is order one. So certainly when around G star is equal to zero, this, this matrix model is dominated by a confined saddle. So there's nothing much to discuss there. Now, if we look for more carefully, there is another interesting saddle, which is a saddle at these specific values as a function of A1. And what we can do now is to plug this G star, this particular form of G star inside the function Q here. And what we can do is to study this function Q uh, by plugging in G star and study the dependence, the, the function of its real part as a function of A1. And if we can find a region where as a function of A1, this real part is positive, we are confident that this matrix model of just a single couple of a single coupling will be growing and scaling as order n squared. Okay. And in particular, this, uh, this uh, region here as a boundary and the boundary of this region is precisely where the real part of this function is equal to zero. I'm gonna call this boundary here by CD and CD for me, something that I'm gonna call the deconfinement curve. So this is a curve in complex A1 space because it's a line and, I'm, and it's this curve here. Okay, so the logic is that this matrix model here will be showing a deconfinement in this region here. So in all this region here, the model is deconfined. And outside this region, so in this area here, we cannot find any exponentially growing behavior. So the model will certainly not be uh, deconfined outside this region. 
And let me make two important remarks here. First of all, if this coupling A1 was real, then the entire uh, deconfinement curve, so this entire thing would collapse to only one point here. So the deconfinement curve for A1 real would be that would be when the coupling is equal to one. But we know that uh, this was the special point that I discussed for you before in, in this analysis. So A1 equal to one is exactly the point here where in the real case, we expect a phase transition to kick in. Now, let me, let me stress this point, which is important. When A1 is complex though, the most simple thing we could do is just to study this line, the line where the real part of A1 is equal to one. But we see right away that from this analysis, the line where the real part of A1 is equal to one is not special at all because we are here and on this line there is no, so in particular we can be in a, if we are in a space here where the real part of A1 is positive, there is no phase transition whatsoever. So, so the phase transition that we have to discuss in the complex case only happens across this red curve here. And so that's a phenomenon that uh, in our work we defined as a delayed deconfined. It's delayed because we might expect that there is deconfinement taking place in these areas, but it doesn't really kick in in that areas. Well, while it kicks in across this region here. And in particular, in this simple model, we, we can see very clearly that there are two saddles which exist. So here there will be two saddles and across these lines here, these two saddles switch their dominance exactly, for example, as what we saw in the gravity picture. And that's very interesting because across these walls, uh, we have a change of, uh, of, of a change of saddle. So, and that's completely typical of what we know and love about first order phase transition. And I just want to make a small remark is that if we go back to the study of, uh, for example, the theory with only one coupling, uh, there wouldn't be such coexistence. So in all this region, there is one saddle that exists. And when we hit this point, there would be another saddle that exists, but the two saddle on this real line never coexist. So that's an interesting uh, difference between the real coupling case and the complex coupling case, which is very interesting. But now uh, there, is a, there is a technical point now that we also need to fix, which is the following. Because the large N transition that we just, we are trying to understand with this uh, complex coupling A1, it's first order. So it's first order. We cannot in any way ignore corrections from these higher N couplings. So, so we, we decided to study a model uh, which truncates uh, the coupling to just one coupling. And we thought, okay, let's see if this model is like a good approximation of the full model with infinite number of couplings. But clearly that's not a good approximation because we just saw that the transition is first order. So there is no way in which we can separate the corrections from parametrically the correction from these higher couplings. And so uh, that might be worrisome because then we would have to study a model which has double traced interaction and an infinite number of terms. That sounds uh, very scary, but it is interesting though that there is a region in this uh, general complex, in this general complex YM psi plane that we can analyze very carefully where the effects of this coupling AN minus one are just numerically small. Okay, so we don't have any parameter or any parametric suppressions of this coupling, but we can evaluate them and see how small they are in a little bit like uh, what you do when you do perturbation theory in quantum electrodynamics. 
So even though it's a priori a slightly ill-defined procedure, we can do perturbation theory around using these higher couplings just because their numerical value is extremely suppressed with respect to the first coupling. And in particular, it will be very interesting, I will show you very soon, that in a sense, the simplest improvement of this toy model that we can introduce will be very good to reach our final goal. So I'm gonna tell you that the best model that uh, you can study and that will match very well the prediction with gravity, it's a model which has just two couplings. And I'll show you that in a, in a few minutes. Okay, so, so the story, let, let me just re repeat for you the, the main points. The main points are the following, that if we wanna find these deconfined phases, we need to look for general values of the fugacities. But if we wanna look for general values of the fugacity, we have to modify our study of matrix model to matrix model with complex couplings. And when we do that, there are a few things that change. First of all, deconfinement only happens across this barrier here and not across this line. And also the, the phase, the order of the transition is purely first order. So we cannot really truncate the model to just one coupling. Okay. Sorry, can, can you explain this thing? What is the link between the order of the transition and the possibility of uh, truncating the thing? So why, if it, if it were a uh, second order, then it would have been no problem? Yeah, because in second order, ah, okay. So yeah, so in second order, so for a higher order transition, it's just, you know, there's a, it's just universality. It's like you are at the fixed point and all the couplings. I see, so you have to see that all the others are irrelevant. In the Wilson. Exactly, exactly, exactly that point. Okay, thanks. It's just Wilsonian universality. Okay. Um, okay, let me just uh, go to the to the point of matching with gravity. Okay, so what does this? So the question is, what does this model predicts or? How does this model compare with the predictions of gravity? Okay, so the final point then is that, so th this deconfinement phase transition that we are looking for, uh, we would like it to be matched by a dual Hawking page transition exactly at the beginning, like at the beginning. So let me tell you what is known about this general uh, ADS black holes. So at the boundary, we have this model with S1 times S3. And so we have to fill up the bulk with one of these saddles B. So this will be one of the saddles that I was discussing at the beginning. And so using the ADS-CFT dictionary, we should interpret the super conformal index exactly as the beginning as, a sum, as basically the contribution that comes from gravity evaluated on this saddle. Okay, and people have, have managed to compute this uh, gravitational action evaluated on the saddle B and found this value here, okay? So uh, this, this variable omega, I introduced it here, can be parameterized in terms of our loved Y and Psi. And so this is a general form of the action of the gravitational action uh, for this kind of saddles here. Okay, so to find the, so again, now we are, we are working with general complex fugacities. So this is a subtlety is also in gravity, uh, but uh, let me not go into that too much. But the important point is that to find again, the Hawking page line, we have to look for the special point, which is a little bit like the special point where the Hawking page transition kicked in at the beginning of my story. But clearly now, because we are working with this complex fugacity, that's not gonna be a point, but it's gonna be a line. So the Hawking page line in this business will be a line in complex omega plane 
that will separate the Euclidean ADS sad dose from the ADS 116 BPS black hole sad dose. And the line is basically the Hawking page curve, which, what is it? Is basically where the real part of this gravitational action is equal to zero. And we can draw this, we can draw this picture here as in the following way. So you see this curve here, which I didn't change color for you. This curve here is the, the Hawking page curve. Oh, sorry, I can. So CP is all is this curve here. And inside this region here, gravity predicts an exponentially growing. Oh, sorry, uh, the entropy scales like order n squared inside all this region. And so the natural question is now, can, can we match this curve here? Can we find agreement between quantum field theory with these complex uh, fugacities and this curve here in gravity? And uh, the interesting point is that our model, which is based on these two couplings, A1 and A2, actually does this job very well. So let me show you what we can do. Using this model, we can repeat the analysis that I shown you before with one coupling, but we have to do it for two couplings. And we can, very interesting, we can match this large and deconfinement curve that we find from this model here with the Hawking page curve that we find here. And so you see this is, so this, this is the Hawking page curve. This will be the curve that we obtain by truncating with only one coupling. And you see the, this window is very large, but as soon as we move in with a model with only two couplings now, so we, we, we improve our truncation to a two model couplings, we find this curve. And this is a, you know, a very good match of the prediction with gravity. And let me remind you that we are working basically in a model which has imperturbation theory. So this is as good as you can get close to that curve. And, but it clearly show that the model, the super conformal index will match this deconfinement curve exactly. And it, uh, it removes certain doubts that people had about the location of this curve here. And so, and in a sense, it kind of confirms once again, the beauty and uh, the interest that we all have in the ADS-CFT correspondence. So, okay, I think I told you everything I wanted to say, but I'd be happy to have a more in-depth conversation. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks again, Luigi, for your contribution. So any, if you have any question, uh, please ask. And before that, I will ask all the participants to unmute yourself and give a clap for giving such a nice talk for Luigi. So please ask question. Well, can you extend this kind of stuff to non supersymmetric uh, models as well? Or, uh... Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there, there is an issue though that uh, non supersymmetric, so, you know, you can, you can write down non supersymmetric matrix model, uh, say of this kind. Okay, mm, but this will be like the large N gauge theories at weak coupling. Mm -hmm. So then, yeah, you can make certain kind of analysis, but it will still be a weak coupling analysis. So then you would have to understand basically how coupling can correct uh, this, this type of curve, how like, you know, turning on non-zero coupling corrects these kind of curves. I see, because here you use the fact that uh, you're sure that uh, your index does not depend on marginal deformation. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so in fact, I didn't, 
you know, I didn't want to present this in a, you know, like bashing someone else, but there were some, some intuition that maybe the curve uh, is not exactly here. And so it was a little bit confusing because uh, if you just follow the old recipe, which is you take the deconfinement curve as to be exactly where A1, the real part of A1 is equal to one, uh, you have a strange prediction. So you don't even get this curve. You kind of are like, like here and uh, that's confusing. So people thought, oh, maybe there are some strange coupling dependence that we don't understand and stuff. But that cannot be in this case because the index is exact. So one thing I think, one thing that will be true in non-supersymmetric theories though is that people have studied in a sense uh, where to expect large N transitions uh, when you put theories on a, even non-supersymmetric theories on a compact space time, like S3 times S1, and maybe you do complex temperature and you study the theory as a function of the complex temperature. And you try to find like uh, large N transitions like that. I think that one thing that will be true still also in this model is that you have to be very careful with using this condition. So many people kept using this condition in the complex case, but this condition, as I said, is not, there's nothing special about that condition in a complex matrix model. What you basically, you need to find, you always need to find this, this thing here to define phase transition in these complex settings. Any other questions or comments? So if not, then I want to thank Luigi again for giving such a nice contribution. And uh, once it is uploaded in thank YouTube, you. I will surely share the link with you. And uh, stay safe and healthy. That's more important. Thank you. And uh, yeah. maybe in near future, once things will be okay, we can meet again. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks yeah. a lot for the invitation. Shoot. Hi, take care.